Hello everyone, so Louise has teared us up really nicely there, a few segues into what we're going to talk about just now. Uh, so what we're going to do is we're going to talk through some of the long-term data and evidence from Windermere uh, to really illustrate some of the pressures and changes that Louise has just been talking about. So just to really ram it home, I suppose, freshwaters are really important and precious ecosystems globally. They provide society with all kinds of benefits, like the water supply in different contexts and recreational opportunities, so eloquently described by Taylor at the start of this, uh, of this evening, many other things besides. Fresh waters, though, are also really threatened. They're incredibly biodiverse, given their land surface area, which is really quite tiny on a global scale, but they have a disproportionately high biodiversity. However, we're seeing the biodiversity decline globally. We've seen that in the news. It's particularly acute for freshwater systems, and that's led to people calling for an emergency recovery plan, essentially, for freshwaters. So this is one of the actions that we're all going to take um, as societies in order to reverse this trend to bend the curve of biodiversity loss? What are we going to do to restore these systems? So there are big calls for those actions to be taken and, and soon. So it's never been more important to have data and evidence. We need this information because this is our means of tracking how freshwater ecosystems are actually changing over time, whether it's for the worse or whether it's their recovery when we intervene in some way to try and restore an ecosystem. We need evidence in order to see if those measures are actually effective. And what we're going to do is show you some such evidence from Windermere. You've just heard it's very well monitored and has been for several decades. Uh, we've looked at the physics, chemistry and biology of this lake in some depth over that time. And the FBA started this monitoring scheme, as you've just heard, and then our institute and its predecessors took that over since the late 1980s. Uh, the people that actually set up this monitoring scheme, uh, you can see a couple of pictures at the bottom here, probably wouldn't have guessed uh, the ways in which their da the data from this scheme would have ultimately been used. It really wasn't set up for this purpose, but it's an amazing legacy. So I'm going to hand over now to Ellie, who's going to talk you through some of, the, uh, some of the patterns that we're seeing, and then I'll come back at the end and add a little bit more to that. Thanks, Steve. Yes, so uh, the next part of the talk is really uh, looking at some of the data that we've collected over the time period of the monitoring, and we're going to do a whistle-stop tour through some of the, the physical, chemical, and biological components of, of the Windermere ecosystem. So starting first with looking at the surface temperatures, and um, what we've seen um, in Windermere and, and, and several of the lakes in, in the catchment, actually, are is a relatively consistent trend of increasing water temperature by about... 0.2 of a degree every decade since the late 1940s when our records began up until the, the early 2020s. So what that really means is that um, there's been about a one degree rise in the water temperature um, over the, the time period from the, the 1950s up until the 2010s. Uh, and when we're thinking about what that might look like and, and when, the, when the lake is warming, if we look at that in terms of a kind of uh, an annual cycle of water temperature, so it typically peaks in the, in the summertime and is lower at, at this time of year in the, in the late, late winter, early spring, um, what we've really seen in, in terms of the warming, so the orange line relative to the dark blue line on the, on the, on the chart shows us that the warming is occurring more in the spring and, and, and summer period, which is just at the time of year when, uh, when things start to grow. But it's not just about the surface water that's changing in terms of the physical structure of the lake. Um, actually, what happens in, in lakes like Windermere and, and many lakes in this kind of region is that that warming in the summer is, uh, sets up a kind of change in the physical structure of the lake known as thermal stratification. So this is a, a chart showing you kind of the water temperature across uh, water depth over the time period of a year. Um, and what we see is that in the winter time, the water temperatures are the same from the surface to the bottom. So the lake we consider is, is fully mixed. But as that heating starts to occur during the spring and the, and the summertime period, those surface waters warm up. And because warmer water is, is, is more buoyant, is less dense than cooler water, that sets up a density difference between the surface and the bottom of the lake, which affects mixing processes and affects how things are moved up and down, how chemicals can move through the water column. And, and can select for uh, different, different species of algae to grow um, preferentially. 
And so when we look at our long-term records, so we've taken water temperature profiles since the, the late, uh, so since the 1960s, um, when we look at how that's changed relative to, to the present day, what we can see is actually that length of time where we're getting this, this density gradient occurring in the lake has increased by over a month. So um, we're getting a, a longer, longer period of the stratified conditions in the lake than we were historically. And what we're also seeing is that warming is becoming more intense. So we're getting in, uh, more warming at the surface, which is intensifying that density gradient and inhibiting that, those mixing processes between the surface and the bottom of the water. And that's, again, really important for, for affecting some of the, the chemical and biological processes that occur in the water. So moving on to think more about some of the chemical changes that we're seeing in the lake. So we've already heard that um, phosphorus is, uh, is uh, a, an important uh, kind of pollutant, but actually one of the reasons why it's of real interest is because it's a really key nutrient for, for owl growth. So as Steve said, the people who started the work on, uh, on our monitoring program were really interested in understanding the factors that affected uh, the growth of algae. So one of the things that we've measured for a very long time in this record um, is the concentration of phosphorus. So phosphorus is one of the nutrients. You know, if anyone in here is a, is a, is a, is a gardener, you'll know that when you're applying fertilizer, very often it will have some phosphorus in it because plants need phosphorus to grow. Um, and what we can see here are, are an example of, um, of concentrations of phosphorus over time. So these are annual averages um, of two different types of phosphorus. The graph on the left-hand side is total phosphorus. That's a kind of measure of all the phosphorus in the water. Um, and then the graph on the right-hand side is, is a dissolved form of phosphorus, which actually is the one that people are particularly interested in because it's thought to be the one that the, uh, the algae and phytoplankton use most preferentially um, uh, to grow. And what we can see over time is that actually um, the phosphorus concentration, particularly in the South Basin, has sort of peaked during the, 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 uh, the 1990s, so already alluded to this, this change in the water treatment process, which occurred and then has declined since then. Whereas in the North Basin, we've, uh, we've traditionally been much lower in concentration than the South Basin, but actually because of that reduction in the South Basin, they've now kind of converged. Um, and the North Basin has generally had a lower concentration over that time period. So the, both basins are still probably relatively enriched in phosphorus to what they were right back at the start of some of our records in the 1940s, but those concentrations in the South Basin particularly have reduced. Another nutrient that is important for owl growth is nitrogen, and it's much less talked about in the context of, of this kind of thing because a lot of the focus is on phosphorus. But actually, um, again, two forms of nitrogen have been measured in, in our long-term monitoring program, again, because they were thought to be really important for, for um, understanding the way different algae will grow and, and how different species are selected for. So what we have here is um, a couple of uh, graphs showing some dissolved forms of nitrogen in the water. So that's nitrate and ammonia. Um, and what we can see is that actually, unlike the, no the um, phosphorus, in both basins of the lake, the nitrate concentrations have been relatively similar to each other. They've, they've not been that different. And, and similar to the, to the phosphorus in the South Basin, those concentrations again sort of peaked during the 90s and, uh, and have sort of been declining until the 2010s and remained relatively static since then. Um, the ammonia concentrations are pretty variable, um, but again, not showed huge amounts of change, although potentially showing some signs of, of, an, of an increase in, in the, over the last decade. But there's an awful lot of variability in this data, which is driven by some of the, the changes in the different sources um, and, and the way that they're being used. So the final part of the, the, the chemistry of the water that we're, that we're looking at tonight is, uh, is the oxygen concentration. So dissolved oxygen in the water is really vital for, for the animal species that live there, so the aquatic insects and the fish, um, and particularly certain species are really sensitive to what the oxygen concentration might be. So a useful indicator of, of the health of the lake is, the, is an, as a measure of the minimum oxygen concentration measured during, the, during each year. Um, and that tends to occur down in the deep water um, because of this separation due to thermal stratification. Um, oxygen um, gets used up in decompositional processes and is not replenished um, from the surface. 
And what we can see with our data from both basins is they're both showing uh, a significant decline in that minimum oxygen concentration over time. Um, and, and in particular, the South Basin having lower oxygen concentrations overall than, than the North. Um, and that has really important implications for some of these sensitive species that have been mentioned previously. So particularly thing, um, cold freshwater fish species like the Arctic char are particularly sensitive to um, both cold, cooler water and, um, and high oxygen concentrations. And so potentially during the summer when, when these oxygen minima occur, um, we're going to be seeing a contraction of the habitat that's available for them to persist in the lake. So moving on to um, some more biological components of, of, of our ecosystem, and we're going to start here at the, at the base of the food web. So that's, that's where algae come in, really. So when we're thinking about the open water, this is phytoplankton, so free-floating um, sort of um, unicellular species which um, float around in the water. Um, and essentially, they're an incredibly diverse group, really, really interesting. Um, um, and evolved, um, evolved from lots of different branches of the tree of life. But the thing that they have in common is that they all photosynthesize. So they're fixing carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere and producing carbohydrates. And what we see when we, when we look at the algae, they, they like light and they like warmth, and so they particularly grow during the summer period. And the, the green line um, on that graph is giving you an indication of the typical kind of growing pattern that we might see in lakes like Windermere. So what we have is that during the springtime, we get an, in, an initial bloom of algal growth. And some of you may have noticed it, that you get this particularly distinct smell during the springtime. And that's very often this um, really beautiful group of algae called the diatoms, which tend to bloom at that time of year. Then that, uh, that bloom is, is relatively short-lived um, and drops away. And then we get a secondary bloom occurring during the summer. And that, that's made up of a, of a really diverse group of species, um, green algae and, and the blue-green, the cyanobacteria that have already been mentioned today as being a potential issue for, uh, for us lake users. And those, those tend to bloom during the summer months, and then as the temperature cools and the light, the light reduces, those, um, those algae die away and we get much fewer um, growing in the lake during the winter time. So what does that look like in terms of... Um, in terms of algal growth in Windermere itself. Well, taking an approach of looking at a kind of 30-year um, average, which is the dark green line on the graph, versus um, a more recent five-year average of the data, what we can see is there's not been huge changes in the amount of algae growing in the lake basins. Um, if anything, what we're seeing is slightly more algae growing during the summertime in the north basin and potentially slightly less algae growing in the south basin. And that probably is a response to those, those changes in phosphorus that we've seen. Um, but actually not huge change overall. But something that that a lot of swimmers are particularly interested in is the occurrence of har harmful algal blooms. And actually trying to understand when and where these are occurring is a really hot topic in research at the moment, and particularly trying to predict when we might see them. Um, and the UK Centre for Ecology and Hydrology, we run a citizen science app called Blooming Algae. You might have seen it on the, the, the reel at the start. And this is where people can use, their, use an app on their smartphone to send in photographs of, um, of potential algal blooms, which are then verified and added to a database. And, and then you can go onto our website and look at where algal records of blooms have been confirmed. So I've just taken the example here of Windermere um, from 2023. So we had about, um, about 38 records um, confirmed of blooms around the lake. Lake Shore, and, and, and this is the, these cyanobacteria are particularly an issue because they, they're one of their properties is they're very buoyant, and so they get washed into these um, Lake Shore areas, and that's when we encounter them, and they, they can cause problems. So that's um, all I'm going to talk about at the base of the food web, so we're going to move up the food web now, and I'm going to hand you back to Steve. <laughs> I can see Taylor wobbling his sign at me. Um, okay, so what are the zooplankton? You've heard those mentioned a couple of times already, actually, in this talk and in previous ones. It's another open water community. Alongside the, al the algae, there are microscopic organisms that eat the algae and eat each other. Some of them are animals, some of them are not. They're actually protozoans. They're little single-celled uh, critters. I want you to love zooplankton like I do. I know that might take some time. Uh, but, you know, if we've got more time, I'll work on it. Uh, these things are amazing. They consume the algae and they are themselves eaten by bigger invertebrates and by fish. So they're right in the middle of food webs and very, very important because of that. 
very diverse. Um, but what I want to point out is the plot on the left there. These are Daphne, otherwise known as water fleas. You might have met them in school, in science classes. Zooplankton populations are really patchy in space and time. The graph shows the seasonal peaks in Daphne populations in Windermere in two different decades. The dashed line is the 30s. The solid line is the 2000s, just to make the point that seasonal peaks have been shifting. The seasons have been shifting in Windermere, and you can see that through the activity of these grazers. And let's just mention the Arctic char. You saw those earlier. It's quite a concerning story, really. Actually, perch are the most numerically abundant fish in Windermere, but Arctic char are much more probably well-known and, and thought of in, the, in this lake. Their populations have been declining dramatically. Sadly, we've not been able to monitor the char for a few years now because of funding cuts, essentially, but we're wanting to try and work together to try and update this picture and see what the status of these populations is right now. But you can see it's not, it's not a happy-looking story. So I'll wrap us up then. The point we're wanting to make here is really that lakes like Windermere are really sensitive to environmental pressures, and those pressures are themselves really quite diverse. Lakes are not static in time. They change over the course of seasons from year to year and over decades. So we need to be able to understand that that variability exists. Uh, but we've got an absolute wealth of evidence and data that helps us to describe how lakes are changing and why that might be. So what we want you to do going away after this evening, after all of these talks, is to really think about the evidence that you see uh, from all the pre presenters today. So when you're thinking about these issues with Windermere and other lakes, think about the evidence that's there to demonstrate how they're changing and have conversations with each other, with your friends and family, with your local politicians, have those conversations to raise awareness. It's an, an important thing to do. And you can do practical things too. Uh, you're gonna hear some more on invasive species a little bit later, but you can do practic thing, practical things around check clean dry activities to try and uh, mitigate their spread. And you can be involved in citizen science too to help us uh, gather the evidence. You heard about blooming algae and you're gonna hear a lot more uh, about the big Windermere survey shortly. So please get involved and, and be part of the part of this program really thank you